Yeah, let me just first start by saying hi, everybody, and thanks for coming to the Dream Seminar today. Um, I'm going to keep the introduction extremely brief for Marat, but um, yeah, this week our speaker is Marat Arjak, a professor of EECS and mechanical engineering here at UC Berkeley. Uh, he is the recipient of many awards, and also he is a great advisor. Um, I'm not biased at all. But uh, yeah, today Marat is going to talk to us about compositional and hierarchical approaches to large scale control problems. Okay, thanks Marat. Thank you Kate for keeping it brief. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm just filling in this week. We didn't have any outside speakers. Um, so the motivation for this talk is control of large scale uh, control problems, dealing with large scale control problems. So, um, there are many motivating applications for large scale systems. Um, many of us are increasingly dealing with infrastructure networks, which are obviously large scale and interconnected systems. And coordinated vehicle fleets, whether they be autonomous, semi autonomous, and so on. Satellite constellations, low Earth orbit has a lot of satellites nowadays, and integrated defense systems. So the traditional design and verification methods we have in control theory are rather limited in how far they can scale to large systems. And furthermore, uh, typically early results deal with, you know, trying to verify properties such as stability, tracking, uh, some forms of performance, but not some of the more complex requirements that we are encountering today. So in this talk, I'll try to convince you that using compositional and hierarchical approaches help us overcome these limitations, at least mitigate them. And as a motivating application, I'll be talking about vehicle traffic management, which is a, a great set of problems and it involves many layers starting from vehicle level control, uh, road link level control, where you deal with signal timing and things of that sort and network level where you deal with issues of routing. So the outline, the first part, I'll talk about compositionality, how we can divide and conquer a large problem. Second part, I'll talk about hierarchical control and how we use abstractions, the notions of abstractions to, to deal with multiple layers. And the third part, I'll point to some of the applications for traffic management. So first composition approach. So the idea in compositional analysis and verification is exposing a large system as an interconnection of subsystems, essentially bite-sized problems. Um, and you want to verify system level properties for the, for the whole system by composing properties of the subsystems. So what you see here is an interconnection of subsystems labeled G1 to Gn. Each one has a dynamical model of its own, as you see in the orange box. Um, and these subsystems have as inputs these terms VI. VIs are basically the, the combination of the outputs of, of the other subsystems. That's how the subsystems influence each other, as well as potentially an exogenous uh, disturbance term D. So this matrix M distributes those things back to back to the inputs of the subsystems. Uh, and then each subsystem has an output W, which likewise uh, influences other subsystems. And it may appear in, in a system level output E that we may be interested in, in regulating. So if we treat this as a monolithic system, if you, if you of course put all the system equations together, uh, plug in the interconnection, which is defined by the matrix M, you will get a huge large scale single differential equation. And the chances are the, the methods you have available for uh, verifying various properties of the system will not scale to the, this, uh, this size. But on the other hand, the smaller subsystems will be amenable to those tools. So what are the advantages of such uh, decomposition? First, obviously, that will give you scalability. You'll be dealing with smaller problems of manageable size. Uh, the second advantage is that you maintain a system perspective. So when you're dealing with the smaller subsystems, 
you look for properties of these subsystems that are relevant to whatever you're trying to verify for the whole system, right? So you don't get bogged down with nitty gritty details of the model. You look for critical properties. You identify important properties in the subsystems and look for those properties. This also gives us modularity uh, because then we can allow the, uh, analyze the subsystems separately and our analysis can also be parallelized. Another byproduct of this is substitutability, which means that you can take a subsystem and since you're only dealing with critical properties of subsystems that affect the system level objective, if you replace the subsystem with another one, as long as the new one has the desired properties, the overall system level guarantee will be preserved. So the notions of modularity and substitutability here can be sort of visualized with these uh, shipping containers where you can take out one, put in a new one, and they, they fit together and they, are, they give you modularity. So these are, of course, common principles in systems engineering, software engineering, and biology, various types of organization. And as we're dealing with larger and larger control systems, they are becoming important for control theory as well. So I'll give you a concrete example of how we do this decomposition. Um, suppose we are trying to prove a stability or performance um, uh, property for the, the composite system, the, for the whole system as a whole. So I'm going to treat those in one because we typically use uh, Lyapunov functions to deal with stability and storage functions to deal with uh, performance properties such as you know L2 gain from disturbance to the output, right? And all of those are can be handled with these uh, Lyapunov-like functions. So I'm going to use the inequality that you see at the top as the main tool. So V is a Lyapunov or storage function depending on what I'm trying to do. And this dissipation inequality, if I set the right-hand side to zero, um, tells me about stability of a point in the absence of disturbances that becomes a Lyapunov function or with an appropriate cho choice of this W, it gives us an input output property from the disturbance to the output E that we are regulating. It could be, for example, a, a finite L2 gain gamma from disturbance to E if I choose W as in the, as in the equation here. So if the system size is large, then whatever method you're using to find such a function v will likely not work. It's a difficult task for a large system finding such a v and doing this verification. So for example, you may be using tools like you know some of Square's methods to look for v, and those will not scale beyond you know tens of uh, state variables. Usually at six or seven, you hit the you hit the wall, and that's the sort of the limit right now. So instead, what we would like to do is to analyze the subsystem and try to verify the a dissipation inequality like you see at the bottom for each subsystem. Okay, so the right-hand side is a matrix Xi. Those are things you are going to be choosing. Okay, so, and then we can compose those dissipation properties to be able to reach the actual property we want, which is at the top. So here's a criterion for the selection of those X sides. By the way, the right-hand sides in these uh, dissipation inequalities are called supply rates. That, that's the jargon from control theory. So how should we choose the supply rates in a way that we can um, confirm the uh, system level property? So here's an algebraic condition that sort of brings together the supply rates X1 to Xn for each subsystem as well as the interconnection matrix M. So if you have this inequality hole, and P here is at basically a permutation matrix that's appropriately defined, not very important how it is for the purposes of this uh, slide, uh, then we can actually add up the individual storage functions for the subsystems, and that serves as a Lyapunov function or storage function for the monolithic uh, combined system. So basically this follows from some algebra that where the right-hand sides of the derivatives cancel out or come together to 
to uh, create the W term we want in the right hand side of the sum. Okay, so as you can see, this criterion for the composition has M in it, the interconnection. It has W, which is the desired property for the interconnection. And then it has the supply rates X1 to Xn. The question is, how can we find these X1s and Xn's to satisfy uh, this criteria? So, seems to be stuck. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, so somehow I am. Oh. Let's try now. Okay, so um, turns out that the search for those supply rates, we can parallelize them in a distributed optimization framework. So the first inequality, the first dissipation inequality you, you see is a local search for each subsystem. So we're searching over the supplier rates Xi and the accompanying uh, storage function Vi. And we have a global constraint that these XIs must satisfy, and that's what we saw on the previous slide, right? So how can we do this search? So it turns out you can do this in, with various distributed optimization methods, in particular, the very popular method of alternating direction of uh, multipliers method. So the general uh, structure of this distributed optimization is as follows. You have, a, uh, you have this global criterion, Right, And the search over the supplier is sort of a negotiation between a facilitator that looks over these properties and tries to satisfy the global constraint. And so the variables Z, U, C are those that you can show easily that they satisfy the global constraint, the second equation G, right? So, so your program is sort of a negotiation where those Zs are passed on the individ to individual uh, sub problems because those Z satisfy the global constraint. And then you search over, and then you, the sub problems uh, look for supply rates as close as possible to Z and the corresponding uh, uh, storage function. And they report whatever they can find X1 to Xn. And then the global program will now look at, will try to find a Z that's close to those proposed X's. So it's, it's a sort of a mediated negotiation between the uh, sub problems. So the particulars of ADMM are as follows. You can see in these lines of equations, how this uh, mediated search is done. The subsystems are looking for X's that are close to the proposed ZI in the previous iteration of the, of the search. So they search within uh, the limits of Li uh, for supply rates that are close to Z. And similarly, the global step is looking for Zs that are as close as the Xs that are reported. And the last step in the ADMM is sort of an accumulation of the error that tries to enforce the constraint that Zs eventually match X. So that's one example. And we've, we've, there are many other results with using these dissipation type inequalities for uh, compositional analysis. So one of the uh, important directions was the following. So in what I presented here, I assumed implicitly that we have a known equilibrium. When we teach nonlinear systems courses, we say, you know, we can assume the equilibrium is at the origin because if it's elsewhere, you can shift it by uh, defining shifted variables. But that assumes that you know where the equilibrium is. Whereas when you're dealing with large interconnected systems, imagine power systems or biological networks, if you add a new module in your interconnection, or if you remove one, the equilibrium point will shift. The operating point will shift, right? So that means the analysis you did earlier for each subsystem goes out the window because that analysis was referenced to a given equilibrium point. So what we did was we defined the notion of equilibrium independent dissipativity that removes the it's slightly stronger than the plain old dissipativity, but it removes the dependence on the equilibrium. And with that, we gain complete modularity and substitutability, which are desired properties. Um, we've dealt with stochastic models with appropriate dissipation properties. 
that are adapted to uh, stochastic systems. And we pursued several applications to biochemical reaction networks. And then in a separate line of work, we looked at uh, interconnections with time delays. So we no longer have this instant feedback between the subsystems, but there are time delays. And that sort of thing, of course, happens in communication networks. So in that case, we combine uh, the dissipativity properties with a piece of time scale information that we capture using um, basically a roll of property captured with an integral quadratic constraint. So some of these results, not all of them, uh, were summarized in a tutorial that we published a few years ago. So in this, in this little book, we um, use dissipation properties, but we also use dynamic dissipation properties, which extend uh, the ones that I showed in the previous slide slides and those basically correspond to state space um, versions of, of frequency dependent integral quadratic constraints. We also looked at methods of exploiting symmetries in the interconnection and this gives us computational advantages, re uh, reduces the number of decision variables, therefore the dimension of the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, we also went beyond stability and performance to address safety verification. Since we're dealing with these sets B, their sub-level sets can also be used to, to certify stability. And we gave several examples from vehicle platoons to internet congestion control and to, to biological networks. So after the appearance of that book, there were a couple of other applications um, and some of those were published recently. In one uh, paper, I work with colleagues in Norway to uh, look at distributed control of load transporting multi rotors. So, and there were experiments. So, the uh, load here has unknown mass, and then there are unknown environmental disturbances, which are, of course, not lacking in Norway, uh, especially wind. So, and then the control laws use these um, dissipation properties that are built on these dissipation properties, and they also have adaptation to build, uh, that is built in to adapt themselves to, uh, to wind forces as well as the unknown mass. Um, the other application um, was to satellite constellations. Uh, you're seeing more and more of those, especially in low Earth orbit. Uh, for example, the company Planet Labs in San Francisco, they are dealing with surveillance of the Earth with hundreds of, of satellites. So the goal here is once these small sats are delivered to orbit, they'll be sent one after another. So you want to reach a splay state so that they don't, so whatever they are surveilling uh, covers a larger swath of the Earth. So you, you want to bring them that splay state, and you also want to maintain them there despite disturbances. So bringing them to that state is called the acquisition phase, and keeping them there is called station keeping, and we use this dissipation type uh, properties and controllers based on them um, to, to achieve this. And they are, by their very structured distributed controllers, they only rely on information from the neighboring satellites. So that's uh, pretty much what I'm going to say about compositionality, although compositionality will again come into play later uh, in different forms. So in the second part, I'll tell you a little bit about hierarchy. So for example, in um, many applications about the feedback control level, you'll have planning guidance and sort of, uh, supervisory control layers. And you may have a higher level decision-making layer dealing with contingencies, um, resource allocation and things of that sort. So the question becomes how, do you, how to make formal guarantees for, this, for a stack like this uh, despite the fact that very often these layers are designed by different groups of people who have different methodologies, different formalisms, different semantics. So this question was posed by uh, Praveen Varaya in a cute paper back in 2000, um, how to deal with the, how, to, how the, to, to join these different worlds of the different layers. 
So as a metaphor, this sort of reminds me of the of this uh, tree, the famous tree Yggdrasil in Norse mythology. It's an ash tree that connects the nine different worlds. So Midgard is where humans live. Asgard is where the Aesir gods live, like uh, Odin and Thor. Uh, so it's a, it's a tree that connects them. And of course, these are different worlds. So it's a similar concept to what we are trying to achieve here. So first I'll tell you a little about discrete abstractions and what we do with them. So uh, the idea in discrete abstractions is you have a continuous state control system, but you want to represent it as a finite state uh, discrete transition system. Uh, what is the advantage of that? The advantage is that if you can do that, then you can use close conforming methods and design controllers that can deal with complex uh, requirements such as those expressed perhaps as automata or perhaps in, in, in the form of temporal logic. And you can refine those controls back to the continuous state model. Okay, so that's the motivation for these types of abstractions. So it sort of becomes a supervisory control action. So how is the abstraction done? You split the state space of continuous state variables X into different bins essentially, and those bins become the discrete states. And now you do forward reachability analysis from each bin with a fixed controller, a fixed control choice, the quantized control choice, to see which others you can transition to. And now you collect this information and um, to, to get the transitions in the discrete system. So uh, when we do design based on this abstraction, the guarantees we can make for them also carry over to the lower level of the, the concrete continuous model under appropriate simulation relations between the uh, finite abstraction and the continuous state model. And probably the most um, up-to-date one of among those simulation relations is the one by Rysig, it's, they call it a a feedback refinement relation. And under that relation, uh, the guarantees from the formal synthesis for the finite state model will carry over to the continuous state model. So the essence of the design methodology is shown in this figure. So let's say um, you're applying control U1 and you're in the gray box. And the green shape here is the exact reachable set from the gray box. So because that intersects with the uh, purple and yellow boxes in your abstraction, you direct transitions under U1 to those two discrete states. And let's say that another input U2 takes you to purple and red states. And let's say that the red state is unsafe. You don't want to go there. No political fund in tangents is red. Uh, doesn't mean anything. So, um, and obviously the control synthesis will uh, proceed by pruning the inputs to maintain the desired properties. And of course, safety is the simplest thing you can deal with. You can deal with a lot of uh, complex uh, temporal logic uh, requirements as well. And usually they are uh, designed using various games on graphs. So this type of thinking, splitting the continuous state variable system into partitions and using hierarchical control to trigger transitions between the partitions goes back to the 1990s to the work of Lunze, Reich and Peter Keynes and their uh, co-workers. And in the past 10 years or so, there has been a lot of progress, both in the abstraction and in using um, formal methods to synthesize reactive controllers based on those discrete models. And this general genre of work is called symbolic control. And these are some of the names that come to mind and maybe possibly uh, for being others. So um, this is all great. However, there's a big problem in this approach. So there are severe computational bottlenecks that uh, limit their applicability. First of all, as you've seen, uh, this relies on repeated reachability, reachability computation from each uh, from each bin, right? So those don't scale well. Even if you could do that somehow, you'll have an exponential growth of the discrete state as the, the dimension increases. The more continuous states you have, 
to, there is a, there is going to be an exponential increase in, in the number of the discrete states. And along with that, you have such an explosion in the transitions between the discrete states. So how do you, how do you deal with those uh, computational bottlenecks and the associated memory requirements? That has been what's holding back uh, symbolic control to date. So we have mitigated some of these bottlenecks by focusing on special classes of systems and special classes of requirements. For example, to make the forward reachability analysis scalable, we use uh, intrinsic systems properties, such as an extension of uh, monotonicity, which we call mixed monotonicity, uh, as well as contraction properties in the system, and more recently, statistical learning to be able to infer the forward reachable set from samples. Uh, some of these are being are going to appear in an upcoming Springer book uh, that is probably going to be published early next year. It's uh, under production right now. So we also used um, to, so that part deals with scalability, but even if we can deal with scalability, we have this explosion of states. So, and how many times you call the um, reachability subroutine is also a problem. So in this work that appeared in CDC 17, we use the sparsity in the, in the continuous dynamical model because not every state equation will depend on every other state. So we use that sparsity to, uh, to reduce dramatically the number of reachability computations that we have to actually do. In addition to that, we use binary decision diagrams for, for more efficient storage of the, of the abstraction. In subsequent work, we also added parallelization of computations on top of this sparsity aware abstraction. Also parallelization was used in the synthesis step, as well as uh, in the most recent work that uh, Alex presented in July, I believe, we also used parallelization for reachability computations. And we saw that uh, we can increase the dimensions that we can deal with dramatically. So in addition to these, uh, in addition to the sparsity aware abstraction that exploits sparsity in the inherent model, uh, we also deal with sparse abstractions, which are uh, not sparsity in the system structure per se, but this, we assume a structure in the system that gives us an order preserving property, a monotonicity property, in which case, knowing that we transition from one state to another one allows us to infer similar properties for a whole bunch of other states that we haven't examined just because of the order preserving property. And that's what I mean by sparse abstraction as opposed to sparsely aware abstraction. Um, also in this paper in Automatic 2017, uh, we were able to split the synthesis stage into subsystems and being able to compose them using the, uh, the theory of assumed guarantee contracts between the subsystems. So if you're attending the upcoming CDC in December, we have a tutorial session on December 18th to Friday, in which we will um, go through basically the monotone systems theory or its variants that we use in these uh, reachability and safety analysis methods. So in addition to discrete abstractions, we can also do continuous abstractions, which basically means that you're trying to represent a continuous state where a model, not with a discrete transition system, but another continuous state model, but possibly a lower fidelity one, a simpler one, one that can perhaps you can use in real time for planning or in other applications for an aggregation of a large scale network. So, so you have this abstraction. In addition, you have the refinement stage, which essentially is a feedback law that tries to bring the trajectories of the actual concrete system shown at the bottom closer to those of the, uh, the one on the top. And the bottom one would typically represent a higher fidelity model that you may be using for feedback control. So to connect these two, um, we need to be able to say something about how much the outputs of each differ from each other. And this is done using the notion of simulation functions that was introduced by Antoine Girard and George, pa George Papas in 2009. So this is essentially another dissipation inequality. You're looking for a function V of both the concrete state X and the abstract state X set. And this function has the property that when it's small, as you can see from the second line, when V is small, the outputs 
of the two systems are closer together. And the top inequality shows you that this B will eventually get, get small. So the one of our contributions here was to, to relax this type of uh, simulation function. We call these approximate simulation functions. When we allow this residual term R that may depend on you had an X hat. If you want to eliminate that residual term altogether, then you're looking at very restrictive geometric conditions that must hold because that basically describes a manifold on which X and X hat behave the same, the same way. This actually is closely related to the, uh, the problem of model matching that uh, was studied back in the 1980s, in fact, by Maria Di Benedetto, who we know is related to our friend Alberto, our colleague. Um, so we want to relax the geometric conditions by allowing this residual term. So, what, so how do we search for a simulation function and an accompanying refinement feedback law? We do that in one paper using some of squares programming. Uh, in another approach, we want to deal with larger scale systems and we decompose basically using the compositional approach, similar ideas that were in the beginning of this talk. Uh, we instead look for dissipation inequalities for subsystems and come up with criteria where we can compose them together to find simulation functions for the monolithic system. So one of the applications of this um, continuous abstraction framework is to planning, combining planners and uh, controllers. So in this case, the abstract model plays the role of a simplified planning model. For example, it could be a linear model so that you can use MPC uh, in real time. Uh, for uh, trajectory planning. Um, and then the refinement step is going to be essentially a tracking controller. The complex computations that go into the calculation of the simulation function and the refinement controller are done offline. And what you are left in real time is a simpler, lower fidelity model that you can use in real time. Uh, in this paper that we presented at the IFAC conference in the summer, we apply this to um, a ship docking problem. So as you can see, because we're anticipating a tracking error, the planner has to account is to make provisions for this tracking error by bloating the obstacles and shrinking the target set. And this study was motivated by autonomous ships and autonomous docking that our friends are working on, including in a um, startup company that that designs these uh, autonomous little vessels. Um, so the planner has to account for the tracking error. Uh, so that's the essence of this work. So in fact, when we apply the um, abstraction, continuous abstraction framework to planner and tracking control design, it has many similarities to the recent work in uh, Claire and Marco Pavone's groups uh, that use a similar technique to, to minimize the error between the low fidelity model and high fidelity model. There are some differences, but at a high level, conceptually, it is very similar. One difference, perhaps to point out, is that because in our abstraction, we're allowing for this residual term that I'm just referring to, now our tracking error also depends on the on the states of the planner. So we can't independently say something about the tracking error. So therefore, the, the controller also has to account for some guarantees, has to take some guarantees from the planner about the size of the uh, planner states and to work this into its um, into the guarantee that it gives for its tracking error. So, and there are a lot of tuning, interesting tuning problems that arise here. How do we make sure that the, the planner is more permissive and we don't unnecessarily restrict it? So in this ACT paper also presented this summer, uh, we presented a optimization procedure so that we can uh, tune the margins, the tracking error margins and avoid conservativeness in the, plan, in the planner. Another application of the 
continuous abstraction framework is to network aggregation. So in this case, we have a large scale network with many, many individual agents and their variables. And but for control purposes, we aggregate them into areas of similar agents into a smaller number of groups. So in this study as well, the abstraction ideas come into play. For example, uh, one of the, one of the um, examples that we studied as part of this paper was uh, building temperature regulation where you may not care about individual rooms individually, but rather areas of rooms. And the aggregate model can describe aggregate variables and aggregate temperature variable, for example, in one wing of the building. And you can refine your controllers to the individual rooms from there. And similar ideas we've been using a lot in studying uh, gene expression patterns in multicellular biological systems. And there also we've been extensively using ideas of aggregation. Instead of dealing with a huge number of cells, we aggregate them into cells that have similar fates eventually. So uh, in this last part, I'm going to talk a little bit about our applications to traffic management. And this is an application where layers arise very naturally. Uh, at the lower layers, we have vehicles, their own control, perhaps the forming platoons with vehicles and the control of platoons. As we go to the road link level, we look at problems of, of signaling, um, signal timing plans, uh, on-ramp metering and things of that sort. And then, at the high level, we have various routing problems. And of course, these layers can um, use information from each other for more efficiency. So the overall um, objective of this project, that is an NSF-CPS project, is to increase the throughput while reducing congestion and enhancing safety by connecting the layers. And of course, by leveraging connected vehicle and infrastructure technology. So one of the a uh, specific task in the project was to demonstrate urban platoons. Uh, platoons have been demonstrated in highways before, but in, in real traffic, they become more challenging. And the goal here is to increase the throughput by making the vehicles move as like sort of like a train. So you don't have this slinky effect when they are starting from red and accelerating and the distance between them separates. That way you can double or even triple the capacity of each intersection. So we went down to Southern California to do these experiments with several students, uh, Stan from my group and Yo Jun from uh, Francesco Guerrelli's group were leading this. Uh, so we were there for a couple of days with a number of experiments. At some scary moments, there was more than once that I heard screams on my cell phone from the other car, but we prevailed and uh, overall it was a successful demonstration. So at the road link level, uh, we've been looking into using formal methods and discrete abstractions. So typically the signal control is based on steady state assumptions uh, that are tuned, you know, steady state conditions and timing plans that are tuned to those conditions. So the problem we posed was, can we deal with finite horizon goals, perhaps dissipating cues, avoiding saturation, things of that sort, which we can in fact express in temporal logic. So if we could represent the natural flow dynamics of the, of the um, road network as a discrete uh, transition system, then we could use uh, results or synthesis techniques from temporal logic. And that's what we've been doing for some time. Um, and some of these ideas for you know, exploiting structures such as monotonicity properties for uh, for reachability, they actually uh, were those properties were identified in this application. The mixed monotonicity property, for example, arises naturally in these types of flow networks. So we do a finite abstraction based on the finite abstraction. Uh, we design a controller. The controller is, is essentially a lookup table. So you tell the lights to turn red or green. Uh, based on the current state of traffic. And as you can see in the plot on the left bottom corner, that is defined, the current state is defined by a quantization of the state. So you don't necessarily need an accurate count of how many vehicles are on, the, on a given link. You're rather um, uh, 
group them into bins like low occupancy, intermediate occupancy, high occupancy, et cetera. And then the controller acts accordingly. So we summarized uh, our results as well as um, some background information for the, in this tutorial paper that appeared in Control Systems Magazine now three years ago, I believe. And finally, going up the ladder, going up the tree to the network level. So we've been studying the dynamics of congestion gains. Uh, so in this setup, the users, the drivers choose their routes, a sequence of links that get them from an origin to a destination. And that determines the flows on each route um, and therefore the flow on each link. Depending on how much flow there is on a link, that determines the speed on that link and therefore how much travel time you'll be exposed to. So the questions we ask are how do the route choices evolve? Do they converge to Nash equilibria of the underlying gain, the congestion gain, or do they converge to other attractors such as limit cycles, which are known to happen? So um, the compositional stability analysis that I talked about in the earlier part of this uh, talk actually comes in handy in this setup as well. Uh, and it allows us to give global convergence conditions to Nash equilibria. And uh, they're applicable to some of the new problems that are arising in this domain when we allow some of the vehicles to be autonomous so that they can maintain a shorter headway and therefore their effect on the resources is less because you're there, they move tightly together. They use less of the resource than human driven vehicles. So there's that asymmetry and the generalized dissipativity tools account for that asymmetry. So this was built on some of the seminal work by Hofbauer and Sandholm, Fox and Shama, Park Martins and Shama that came before us. So to summarize, compositional and hierarchical approaches are extremely useful for large-scale control systems. They offer us scalability, modularity, substitutability, and they allow us to even deal with complex requirements. So abstractions allowed us to connect different layers with different formalisms and still get formal guarantees for the control stack. And we saw that traffic management is a rich application domain that offers several problems at different layers and there's definitely opportunities for connecting those layers with the help of connected vehicle infrastructure technology. So in several places in the talk, we made use of this patriotic theory, um, which is in fact slightly older than me, uh, but it's shown, it's proven to be very useful in many, many different contexts. And recently in my work, as well as others, it has proven to be extremely useful for compositionality. So I'll take this opportunity to also acknowledge Jan Willems, who is the inventor of this methodology. And I'll stop here to take any questions. And I have put on chat a list of uh, publications that were sort of mentioned in this talk uh, briefly or in detail. So if you're interested in tracking them down, you can find them in that PDF file. All right, so I'll stop here and take any questions.